Hey, what's going on guys? It's Jack. Back in to bring you my guide to Halls of Infusion. Whether you're a tank, healer, or DPS, this will give you everything that you need to know to be able to chest this dungeon to begin with. There are not a lot of skips that are easily achievable in this dungeon, and a lot of the dungeon is going to be pressing W. There's also ridiculously bad runbacks, and I believe that this dungeon is going to be the hardest at the start of the expansion. So we're going to talk about the route. We're also going to talk about what's going to wipe you more likely than not. At the start of the dungeon, you do want to get around 35 or 40 percent before you fight off against Watcher Iridius, and you'll fight primarily Defenders and Geomancers. At the start of the dungeon, these Defenders will cast a damage down. It's like a demoralizing shout, but it works on every damage ability. They also are going to be casting these Frontals, and it's almost like a uh, Fists of Fury that they're going to cast, that they're going to root themselves in place and channel towards the tank. If you get hit by it, you're going to be afflicted with a very nasty bleed. Tanks can always just be backpedaling out, and they can sort of just constantly backpedal as they fight these guys. Geomancers are going to just leap up into the air and try to stomp down on players. So range DPS wants to stay pretty close so that the mobs don't have to run super far to be able to get back in place. But in our testing, those stomps were larger than they appear. So make sure you give yourself some extra space. A lot of the early pulls have multiple defenders, two or three, and they cast fairly frequently with this damage down. So it's really, really important that you focus them down quickly and have enough stuns and interrupts to be able to deal with them. You also are going to fight off against these like sort of containment units, these golden orbs that they just perma channel damage into your allies. They deal a lot of damage and you can also be focusing them and prioritizing them down if your kicks on the defenders are very accurate. There's also a totem uh, shortly after you go into the left side of the room, which an engineer can activate, which will give everybody a one-time cheat death for the dungeon. What this does is it actually absorbs a killing blow and allows you to sort of stay alive. So if you're at 2% health and you're taking ticking damage from Iridius, for example, it'll soak up one of the ticks of damage, keep you at 2% health, and then you'll die to the next tick. But if, for example, you get hit by like a stomp, It'll eat the entirety of that stomp, and then you'll still be at that same health percentage. So picking this up and having an engineer can be pretty dang helpful. Once you fight up against Watcher Iridius, like I said before, have it around 35 to 40 percent. Trash percentage is quite good. Higher key groups will want to have more percent for one of the difficult skips we're going to talk about a little later. But on Iridius, you want to make sure everybody is stacked. His static charge deals really intense damage for about six, seven seconds. His power overload is heavy dot damage to three targets, and it's really useful to have a mass dispel. But if you do not, it might just be better to have to heal through those three dots, place the void zones when they either expire or are dispelled, and then make sure everybody is running in the same direction to get out of those void zones. Since they drop and they increase in radius as the fight goes on, you need to make sure that you're not standing in the middle of the room for the boss's intermission, where he's going to go into the intermission and more containment units, orbs are going to come out. Tank needs to be able to tank them on top of Iridius to break him out of his shield for the intermission. And then you go back to that regular phase. And once again, he's absorbed more energy. So the damage radiuses continue to get larger for the lightning pools. And he'll even have the lightning pools dropping at the same time that he's pulsing AoE onto the entire party. So lock gateways, roars are really, really clutch to be able to have on hand. Otherwise, dodge the boss's frontal and just stay alive through those static charges. One of the primary areas a lot of players are going to wipe is after Iridius. So you have two routes you can go through this whole mess of frogs that are all stacked on top of each other, or you can go off to the side if you don't have as many poison dispels, but it sort of takes like a longer walk to be able to get there, and trash is way more spread out. If you want to go the technically more efficient route, you kind of walk into shock troopers. These guys are going to cast a buff on themselves that allows them to cast chain lightning. It's instant casts. So the second that they activate the buff on themselves, they sort of just pulse chain lightning every like five or six seconds and it deals obscene damage. So make sure you're kicking those and, and killing them off as quickly as you can. There's also a stalker on the right kind of in a corner that you can add in. And I say this because I think it's more important to kill off those mobs first and then you activate the horde of frogs. When everybody is cleared of poisons and has not taken any damage from frogs yet, you get everybody stacked together, popping their defensives and stuns, and you try to blast the frogs as quick as you can. A big problem that happens with these groups is people run all over the place and try to avoid getting hit by the frogs as best they can, and then slows and stuns and crowd control wears off, and then the frogs are just running free and super spread out and killing everybody. It's a surefire way to wipe. I've seen it happen more times than I can count. 
on PTR. If you stack, pop all your defensives, make sure you get all the ads stacked together, you're going to have a lot easier of a time. Once again, these Skulking Zealots are going to stun the tanks, and those Skitterflies are also going to cast Frontals that Disorient. They also can be dispelled, so if a tank gets hit by it, make sure you have it at the ready. The mini bosses that occur just a little bit later will root players and try to drop a nuke on them. That's easily dispellable. And they have a cauterized cast that you need to be able to interrupt, as well as a pyretic cast, which is a tank nuke. So you want to interrupt most of those, but prioritize the cauterized cast. On the frog boss, he has two different AoEs that do, or two different abilities that deal AoE damage. One of the croaks will do damage and also cause rubble to fall from the sky. And then there's another effluvia, which sort of just pulses damage outside of the boss's radius. Uh, both of them need quite a bit of healing. He also is going to be spawning some more frogs of his own. What happens here is he will spawn frogs and then he will cast gulp. So when the Cast for the Frogs is coming out from a Fluvia, I believe it is. You want everybody to be very close into melee range to stack up all these frogs together. When the Gulp goes out, you want to make sure as many frogs as possible get gulped so that they can just instantly be killed. But a tank must soak the Gulp, otherwise the boss is going to enrage, which increases his Fluvia and Croak raid-wide, party-wide damage. So make sure you keep an eye on that. This next area is a massive spot that you could wipe on. Uh, the cheat code, of course, if you have a rogue and, or if you have a rogue or invis pots, and if you have a mind soothe, because you kind of need all of it, you can use mind soothe and shroud to be able to skip past these guys, and it's really, really overpowered. The dragons can see through stealth, so just having a invis pot on its own is not going to be enough. You need the mind soothe to reduce the aggro radius. But if you do not have these, the glacial dragon casts a very large party wide AoE that also deals a damage over time effect to everybody in the group that can be dispelled and mass dispelled. I believe you can also remove it with freedom, tiger's lust, other things like that that get you out of those roots and snares since it works very similarly to the slows that you saw out of Shadowmoon Burial Grounds. But the damage is incredibly intense out of these dragons and you really can't pull more than one of the dragons at a time. The amount of damage these guys deal is just absolutely incredible. And some of the casters on top of it have some channel effects, which also deal very heavy damage. So if there ever were a time to skip mobs, it would be at this point into the dungeon. Kajin is the third boss, and the entire fight she is just pulsing party-wide AoE damage. It's very steady damage, like the second boss of Court of Stars. She has an arrow that comes out of her body, where she's going to be shooting a tornado at one player. She locks onto the location at the start of the cast, and so you can easily be sidestepping and moving out. If her tornado hits any ice cube, the ice cube is going to explode for damage to anybody who is too close. So make sure you're not aiming it at an ice cube and make sure you're not in the path of the tornado, otherwise you're dead for sure. There's a number of uncracked and cracked ice cubes around her in the room. The ones that are uncracked, of course, are not gonna have any lines in them, any cracks in them, but they also are gonna have a nice pillar of light around them as well. So that way you know it's going to be a safe spot. Keep up party-wide healing, make sure you're dodging the tornado, and then she's going to have a Kurog mechanic where you have to run in and out of the circles that she's spawning around herself. Otherwise, this boss has a very high healing requirement and is blast to heal, but it can be quite challenging. Once you get through that third boss, you have the gauntlet. You have to watch out for these waves that are crashing down on the left and right side of these sort of like pathways. If you fall or get knocked off the, the sort of platform, you're going to get tossed into a bubble and then pushed all the way back to the start, which can be wiping. The uh, ice ragers are going to try to enrage themselves and just deal more damage. Ice Callers try to cast a heal that can be stunned uh, and must be stunned. And then you have more dragons to fight. Once again, if you have Master Spell, you're going to have a lovely time, but it's still incredibly high damage onto this group. Uh, the biggest thing at this point is making sure you're just properly dodging with your group. Make sure your tank is facing any of these frontals away from the group from the dragon and getting as many AoE stuns to be able to AoE down these Ragers because they can kind of stack up a lot of tank damage if you let them get a little bit out of control. Once you get to the end of the Gauntlet, that's when you fight the Infuser. She has an Inundate cast, which is very similar to what you'll see out of the Primal Tsunami from the Intermission uh, that deals quite a bit of party damage. And she also tried to cast a barrier onto herself, which is just going to add more defensive power to her. So make sure that you get that interrupted. This this gauntlet can deal a ton of damage and again if you release you start way back at the start of the dungeon which is incredibly debilitating the primal tsunami is going to pretty regularly have a big aoe out of the fury but that's usually not something that's going to kill off too many players 
The tank is going to get knocked back, very similar to what you saw out of like Shrine of the Storm, if you played in that dungeon, where the tank gets like channeled on and pushed back. The problem is the boss is very unforgiving with its swing timers and can often turn and kill a melee when the tank is not in range because they were knocked back. So if you have ways to avoid the knockback, get gripped back into location, teleport yourself back into location, that should be a priority for tank players onto this encounter. And melee, just kind of be ready to watch for that knockback because you could eat a melee strike here and there if your tank is not quick enough to be able to get back. At max energy, the boss is going to phase and toss two players each off to different kind of corners of the room, different routes of the room. And once again, you have to dodge any of the waves that are falling out there. And then there is four casters in the middle of the room where the infuser lies. If they continue to channel their infuse, then they're going to give the boss more energy and start another intermission very rapidly. You can then kick those mobs, which means that they're going to start casting inundates, which you need to stun or disorient to be able to cancel. You can also use paralysis or fear or any other crowd control to get them to stop channeling and leave them under a bit of a crowd control effect so that you can sort of kill these guys two at a time. But probably the best and most efficient way to do it is get kicks on all of them, stack them all together, and then try to stun and fear and AoE them all down as fast as possible. Again, taking your time in this, if you have the additional resources for it, is immensely helpful, but this is just an easy way that you could have a few deaths during this encounter, as well as the tank knockbacks killing melee. Thanks so much for watching our Halls of Infusion Guide, and if you're enjoying it, make sure to subscribe for more, and check out the Patreon. Huge shout out to Sebastian, Me Club, Watney, Nick, Potato Banana, Ranger Mankin, Milo, Zach, Julie, Steph, Cecilio, Thoreaker, Fourth Crow, Elif, Calderon, Kevro, Simon, Merle, and John for getting us going on the Patreon. Thank you so much for watching, guys. I hope you all enjoyed it. Let me know which dungeon you want to see next, and I'll catch you all next time.